um, put in the chat what you think gypsy means to you. Um, is it a negative connotation? Is it a positive one? Um, you know, I kind of think about when I think of the word gypsy, I think of that song by Cher, you know, gypsies, tramps, and, you know, I, that, that song, I don't even know what the words were to that song, but I just remember that title. Um, maybe it's kind of people who live here and there, they don't have a home, um, you know, they're kind of nomads, they don't have any particular roots, they don't really own anything, uh, they just pick up and go to the next place, and and uh, sometimes I feel that's the way I am in ministry. I, I'm all over the place, although I do have a home, but there are times that I've been gone so long that I feel like I, I'm a gypsy. Um, you know, do you think of gypsies as having, you know, are they, is it a negative or is it a positive? Is it a good thing? Is it uh, something that you would welcome a gypsy into your home? Um, do you think of them as people that don't have roots, people who don't have faith? Uh, or believe in God. What do you think about when you think about a gypsy? Now, I know modern day gypsies are, have had their own TV shows. And uh, sometimes I've learned that, you know, they have these really strict cultural codes. Um, I know a lot of times the husbands work and the women stay in their RVs, you know, and, and uh, they get married really, really young. They have lavish weddings with lavish uh, wedding gowns with lots and lots of bling. Um, but they also have, you know, some traditions and things they believe in regarding abstinence uh, from sex until you're married. And so um, I did some research on gypsies and, and, and pretty much every culture has had some form of a gypsy, somebody who is not really uh, rooted to any particular place and is kind of a free spirit. So what I want you to do is I want you to get your Bibles out if you've got your phones and I want you to turn to Jeremiah 35. I'm going to do a little check here and see how we're doing and uh, try to do this thing just a little bit differently and and uh, hopefully we'll reach some more people we haven't reached before. And you know that's what the gospel is all about, right? We want to reach as many people as we can. So get your Bible and let's go to Jeremiah 35. Now I've been in Jeremiah for quite some time. I've stopped and started and stopped and started depending on other things that God has given me to do. But Jeremiah is this prophet. He's a single guy, which is kind of cool to me because, you know, who's called to this life uh, to be a, um, a witnesser, an evangelist, uh, a prophet, to go and tell the people they need to turn their way, turn from their wicked ways, turn from their sinful ways and turn back to God. And he would do this for 40 years. And it's kind of funny because I feel like that's kind of me in the same way. I mean, I've been an adult for 40 years and I'm also single. And I don't think Jeremiah had that plan. I mean, most people don't plan to stay single their whole life. But God used Jeremiah in a mighty way. And he, he had good days, he had bad days, but nevertheless, God used him. So in Jeremiah 35, there was a really kind of interesting story. Uh, pretty much all the chapters in Jeremiah is kind of the same thing. You know, God's telling Jeremiah, go do this, go do this, go do this, go tell these people, tell these people they don't change is going to happen. And then once in a while, you'll get a different little perspective, um, a different way that God wants Jeremiah to speak to people in hopes to get them to turn. And so I know you know what I mean. Some of you are watching this and you have witnessed your family, your friends, uh, people at work, and you've tried everything. You've invited them to church. You've invited them to your house. You've maybe given them a card. You've prayed for them. You tried whatever it takes because, to be honest with you, everybody comes to God a lot of times in different ways. Not everybody's going to walk into a church building because maybe they have bad memories of church and maybe they were made to go to church or church. What does that mean to them, right? Some may come simply by you being kind to them and you opening up your home. So God does the same thing in the Bible. God teaches us the different ways that we can reach people. It doesn't always have to be from a pulpit. It could simply be by you telling a story, telling your story, because remember, everyone has a story. So Jeremiah, a prophet, he's sent to continue to tell the people, the Israelites, the truth about who God is and to turn from their sin, to be obedient. There's this group of people called Rechabites, and uh, who, like many people at that time, they were in refuge. They were in Jerusalem, uh, hiding basically from the Babylonians who were having these horrible attacks and these raiding parties, and they were uh, fleeing from them as, as a form of protection. And uh, now the Rechabites are a descendant of Rechab, a Kenite, 
which of course some of you are like, whatever, right, Chris? Making them related to the Midianites, which is Moses' family by marriage. They were followers of God. Now, they were considered to be nomads, kind of like gypsies today. And they were especially known for three specific traditions or rules. Um, one, they were to abstain from wine. Okay. Number two, they weren't to where they were not allowed to build a house or, uh, but instead live in tents, kind of like today, you know, maybe an RV, right? Um, and they were not to plant anything, no vineyards, no, no food, no, no planting of any kind. These traditions were handed down by one particular follower of God. His name was Jehonadib. What a, what a mouthful, right? Jehonadib. He was a follower of the Lord, and in fact, he helped get rid of a lot of the uh, of, of the people, the people that were uh, worshiping Baal. He helped to um, get rid of that particular type of worship, and so he himself was a follower of the Lord and and, and understood. But why he made these particular guidelines? There's lots of different reasons that people have have given opinion of why would he you know, tell his people not to drink, not, not to have a house, and not to plant anything, not to farm anything. And, uh, and these traditions got passed down uh, for a very long lineage of the family of, Re of Re I'm going to say it, let me say it again, Rechabites. So I have a question for you. I want you to put in the chat. What are some traditions that have uh, passed down that may or may not have anything to do with God? What are some traditions, put in the chat, what are some traditions in your family, your friends, whatever, that have been passed down that, um, well, we've just always done it this way. We're going to keep doing it this way, right? I know for me, uh, my mom really believes church service Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Even though I can't find anywhere in the Bible that you have to go to church those three times or even on a Sunday morning. But it's a tradition, something she's used to, something she feels closer to God as a result of it. Um, or maybe in our family, you know, we always have ham on Easter and prime rib at Christmas and, and turkey at Thanksgiving. And it's just a tradition. It's not a rule. You don't have to. But it's always been that way with our family. Um, family reunions. I try to gather up all my family as much as I can because I think reunions are important to reconnect our family. Um, and then there's the more not so serious ones, like should the toilet paper roll go this way or this way? Well, traditionally it goes over, but what's wrong with it going under? Or maybe like in my family, we believe in pine salt. Pine salt kills everything. And uh, if you come into my house and I'll be cleaning, you will smell pine salt. But does it mean it has to be pine salt? You know, so these are just some of the crazy traditions of my family. Um, I, share some of the ones in your family. And, and have any of these traditions caused issues? Have you been so stuck in, in a way of doing something and you've always done it? Maybe your mother did it, your grandmother did it, your grandfather did it, that it's actually affected relationships? It's caused some division? Have, have any family member gotten mad at you because this is the way you've always done it or Maybe in your ministry, well, we've always had a women's event on the third month of the year. You know, we've always had this uh, retreat and, and we're going to keep doing it because we've always done it. And, and yet we don't really know why we do it and we make it a rule. We even make it like sinful if we don't. Well, that's kind of what the Rakovites were kind of like. They created these rules, these guidelines, these traditions, and their people honored them. They were very obedient to these. Um, how about changing a tradition and starting a new one? Maybe there's some things in your life that you decided, you know what, uh, this has always been this way, but I'm going to make some changes and I want to make them to be for a reason. I want God to be involved in these new traditions. For me, it's Christmas time. I, I'm really, really tired of buying Christmas presents for everybody. And I think the meaning of Christmas has gotten lost. And so for me, I really just want to trade names and I would rather go serve at a, in a homeless kitchen or I'd rather help support a single mom and, and, and have the money go there or a single dad than to keep buying each other stuff that just collects, right? That's a tradition I want to start. But I'll be honest with you, I've been asking my family to do this tradition for like 10 years and they say, yeah, and then we get close to Christmas and then they change their mind. Mm. So... Why did the Rechabites have these traditions? 
What was the point of them? Well, wine, I get it. Don't drink wine because it can be addictive. It's like a drug. It's like overspending. It's like overeating. They're saying don't drink wine because they've seen what happens with wine. They've seen the results that maybe some could drink and it's good for your digestion or your heart. But if you drink in large amounts, you begin to get drunk and it changes your judgment. You do stupid things because all the main stupid things I ever did when I was a young adult had to do with alcohol. So I, I can see that being a guideline. Don't drink. But building a home, settling down, nesting is wrong. Why would that be something they would say not to do? And why would planting or farming, I mean, doesn't the word tell us that we're to take care of the land, that we're to eat, eat off the land? I mean, in Genesis 2.15, if somebody would put that scripture in, Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So why would this be a bad thing? I didn't understand it. And I had to do a little bit of research because it just didn't make any sense to me that why would buying a house, building a business, uh, having, you know, planting crops, which is providing for your family, why would that be wrong? Well, this is what uh, the scripture, I interpreted the scripture and others had as well. This is in Jeremiah 25. Or Jeremiah 35, I'm sorry. It says, also, you must never build houses, sow seed, or plant vineyards. You must never have any of these things, but must always live in a tent. Then you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. So we believe that their ancestor who came up with these guidelines, he wanted them to have a less stressful life. For whatever reason, he saw that alcohol created stress, uh, owning a house or home and building that home and building your nest and putting money in it and the stress of building it and then planting a farm and all the work on a farm and all the responsibility of a farm and what if the weather comes and tears down the farm and, and so he just kind of decided, you know what, I want a simpler life and I want him to live a longer life. And we know that, you know, stress can actually kill you early. So that makes sense in that scripture. Then you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. I can see this. I, I can see there's less responsibility when you don't own a home. I can see that, you know, having less stuff to take care of, things you don't have to insure, things you don't have to fix, would open the door for more ministry. And that's kind of like with my life. Um, I rent right now. I don't own a home. And it does free you up because if anything happens with a house, it's not my responsibility. And I have more freedom uh, and flexibility of God's money to go do what I need to do. But that's not everybody's, you know, thing. And some people use their homes for the Lord. Some people have a house and they invite people in to stay or help missionaries. And I'm thankful for that because I'm one of those missionaries that gets to stay in your home. So, but I can understand where his thoughts were. So, you know, I often hear people say, Chris, I want to live a more simple life. So I want you to think about this. Think about your own life. Do you desire this? Has some of the stresses in your life come specifically from the responsibility of the things that you own? Or some of your anxiety and need of medication for your anxiety, does it come from the responsibility that you have? I met a man yesterday who said to me that he used to be a really big, well-known chef. And he says, you know, Chris, I'm 70 years old and I work in the kitchen at the church and I'm not the boss. I love it. He says, you can't really be fired. You don't really worry about too many things and you go home and it's not your responsibility. And so I could see, he goes, and then I have time to work for the Lord because I'm not worried about that. Now understand there are people that are bosses and they have to be a boss and they've got to be over employees. But can you just kind of go, if I had a way to make my life simpler, what would that look like? How would you do this? Would you move into a smaller home? You know, there was the big trend, right, of the tiny home. Everybody was moving into the tiny home. And it, it has made me a little claustrophobic, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I think it's too tiny for me, too tiny. But they did it because they wanted to simplify their life. The people that sold everything and bought an RV and traveled all over the country and, and saw the world, and that's great too, but I don't know if I would want to do that either. I don't know if I'd want to live in an RV for the rest of my life. But so you've done it, and you love it. Would you sell or give away things that you don't need or use? 
You know, the old saying is you, you, you turn everything in your closet backwards, all the, cur all the uh, hangers backwards. And, and as you bring clothes out, you know, you turn it the other way. And then after a year, you can see the clothes that you never wear. Those are the clothes you need to get rid of. Probably the same with shoes. Recently, I gave away three pairs of flip-flops that I love, but they were the worst for my feet. And I finally just said, let them go, Chris. Thin out, reduce, less stuff. Now, some of you who see my house, you know that I love artwork and I love mid-century. And pretty much everything I own is used. It's from a, a flea market, a yard sale, thrift store. Um, but it doesn't matter because it did cost. And whether you pay a little bit for your stuff or a lot for your stuff, it's still stuff. And I have probably a lot of stuff. I, I have a lot of things that people give me as I travel and um, a lot of artwork on the walls and I love the artwork. But there are times that it feels overwhelming. And every so often I'll box a bunch of stuff up and give it away. Things that I don't really am not attached to, things that I don't think really matter that much to me. And, and just releasing and letting go to live a little bit simpler life. Do you ever turn your phone off or your TV or your computer? Um, go off of Facebook for a while or, you know, whatever, with the goal of making things simpler. Maybe rest more, do less, say no more. What do you do to have a simpler life? I mean, that's what their, their, their relative, Jehonadab, that's his name, that's what he was trying to do. He wanted his people to live longer, to live longer. He said, this is what I think needs to be done. But it could be different for you. But that's not even the point of this message. That is so cool, but that's not the point. So here's the thing. Why did God talk to Jeremiah about the Rechabites? So God, in his hundredth, thousandth, millionth attempt to try to get people to change, because he loves us so much. He gives us so many opportunities, so many chances to change. He witnesses to you everywhere, from billboards to people talking to you on the phone, to movies you see, to friends, to intercession. There's people praying for people who are lost. He's trying to get these people to turn, right, in his millionth time. And so he uh, talks to uh, Jeremiah and he says, Jeremiah, I want you to do something. He says, uh, he said, decide, he decides to use the Rechabites and their commitment to their traditions as an example to persuade the Israelites to turn to God, to repent of their sins and to live for the Lord. So God tells Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 25 two, go to the Rechabite family and invite them to come to one of the side rooms of the house of the Lord and give them some wine to drink. Here was their response. This is in Jeremiah 6, 25, 6, 35, 6. I've got to get that reverse right, 35, 2, 35, 6. But they replied, we do not drink wine because our forefather, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. Neither you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. After all these years, they were still committed to their ancestor and their traditions. They were committed to a man's traditions, a person. What about God's traditions, God's guidelines, God's guidance for us? People would rather follow man's tradition than God's? This is God's response. We're going to start in Jeremiah 35, verses 12. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Go and tell the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, Will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord? Jehonadab, son of Rechab, ordered his descendants not to drink wine, and this command has been kept. But I have spoken to you again and again, yet you have not obeyed me. Again and again, I sent my servants, the prophets to you. These are men of God. Jeremiah is one of them. That part I added. They said, each of you must turn from your wicked ways and reform your actions. Do not follow other gods to serve them. Then you will live in the land I've given to you and your ancestors, but you have not paid attention or listened to me. How frustrating for God. He's like, you know, the Rechabites, they follow some dude from years ago. You follow his commitment not to drink and not to sow and not to build. And yet you can't follow me. I'm God. I'm the living God. Wow. God wants us to do the same. 
as the Rechabites. He wants us to have the same trust, but in him, the same commitment, but in him, the same value, but in him, the same calling upon the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. That's what the Rechabites, they resisted the temptation of the wine. This was to give us an example to show that they are so committed to the traditions passed down in their family that they even were able to resist temptation. You have God, the Holy Spirit inside of you. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me for those who accepted Christ as their Savior. Yet we can't seem to find the ability to resist temptation. We can't seem to value what God has given us. We can't seem to listen. We can't seem to turn from our sin and our self, uh, our building of our own kingdoms that's what God is telling them can you just imagine God's like I don't get it of course God didn't say that but that's what I would say I don't get it God are there traditions in your life that have become more important than your relationship with God are your traditions that you're passing down more important than teaching people about the Lord? Do you have to have things your way so much that it actually divides the body of Christ? Are your traditions distracting you? Understand, not all traditions are bad, especially when they draw people to Christ. Are you, you committed more to your business, your job, making money, building your stuff, your kingdom, your beautiful home, showing off your beautiful home, your clothes, your jewelry, your car, having the latest iPhone, your social media presence than God? Following the Lord isn't popular. The Rechabites chose not to fall into peer pressure of the current culture. Because of their obedience, God would honor them. And because of the disobedience of the Israelites, he would punish them. This morning, I was visiting a church with my mom. My mom is church shopping. Some of you know my mom has moved back in with me, and she had some surgery recently. Thank you for your prayers. And uh, we were visiting a church this morning, and the pastor spoke on one piece of scripture, Proverbs 29.1. It said, whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. He was saying is that God has spoken to many of us over and over. He's spoken to you, the person who's watching this, who doesn't know the Lord, has, doesn't have a relationship. Maybe you went to church your whole life, but you really don't have a relationship because you've never accepted that Jesus died for you, that he's your father, that in order to get to God, you have to go through Jesus, that you are a sinner and you need forgiveness for your sins. Some of you are watching this and that's you. And he's saying at some point in time, God will withdraw. How many times does it take for someone to tell you about the Lord? How many sermons do you have to hear? How many times do you have to hear messages in other ways or music or God speak to you? And that's what in Proverbs what was saying is that at some point in time, they became so stiff-necked, they became so rebellious that they weren't reachable anymore. There was no hope. Don't be that person. Some of you are watching this and you're just struggling for whatever reason. You're just going through a really bad time. Life is not what you thought it would be. You thought you'd be in a better place and I get it, I get it, I get it, right? And you're like, you know, Chris, you're right. I get caught up in things that don't matter. I get caught up in things because I just want my way or I've always done it this way and everybody should do it my way. Maybe you're a pastor or a minister in ministry. And you've always done things a certain way. And you expect everyone else to do it your way. Or you're a parent watching this. And because your mama taught you this, your daddy taught you this, you've got to teach your kids. But you look back and you go, well, some of it's good, but some of it's really not that great. And I'm making it more important than the relationship. And some of you are watching this and you say, Chris, I've come so far. God has done some amazing things in my life. And... I can see the value. I can see what this other guy was saying. He was simply saying, hey, I want you to live as long as you can because as long as we're living on this earth, we can reach more people for Jesus. So what do you need to do? So he passed down a message of living longer. But you know what? What our message should be? To tell people about the Lord. That's the tradition we need to pass down. And we need to tell people, you want to live a long life, meaning an eternal life? You need to accept Christ as your Savior. So let's let, let that be the tradition. That everywhere you go, you share your faith. Every time you get an opportunity to talk, you talk about the Lord. 
every opportunity you can, you pray for someone. Because that's the best tradition. And all those other things, you want to plant something, grow something, build something, it's all good, but just make sure it's for God. And every time you're tempted to say, oh, I need one more of this or one more of that, pray and say, Lord, do I really need it? Do I really need one more of something? Or do I just need you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful time with friends again. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord. And I pray if someone heard this message and they don't know you, but they want to know you, they're not sure, have them private message me, Lord. I would love to help them find them a church, get them a Bible, and help start the journey. But for those, Lord, that are struggling, Lord, you know what's going on. You know what's going on in their life, and you know they need you. They need you so much. And they have gotten stuck, Lord, in stuff that doesn't matter. They've gotten stuck in rules and guidelines and, and just habits. And, you know, the older I get, the more habits that I'm stuck in. And, I, and it's hard to imagine life any different. But, Lord, we need to be flexible for you. We need to let go of those things that hold us back and be ready to go like a nomad. Go like a gypsy and go wherever you want us to go. Thank you for those that are hearing this message that you have, they have surrendered it all. They're willing to sell their home. They're willing to sell their stuff. They're willing to do whatever it takes, Lord, to follow you because that's the best tradition. In Christ's name, amen. In our two minutes left, let me do a little commercial. We want to remind you about our Labor Day retreat. The theme this year is this amazing book that I got the honor of co-writing with Pastor Dan Houck, Intentional Relationships, a 12-week Bible study that will change your life. Uh, it continues to change mine, and I help. I co-wrote it. Um, we got a new study that just came out, um, a new study, I'm sorry, a new companion guide. It's called Intentional Friendship. It's based on Chapter 10 in the book, and it's got all those questions, those 650 questions in this book for you to help ask the questions to build good friendships. Uh, Pastor Dan Houck will be joining me and Pastor Freddie for our Labor Day retreat, LaborDaySingles.org. It is the best, by far, greatest retreat I've ever been a part of. Uh, in 20 years, this is my 20th year celebrating ministry um, that I've been a part of. And so please join us if you can. Um, also, please go to the website if you have, if you want to do the study, please go to the intentional. I'll put all that information in a minute, uh, website in order to uh, get your own copy of the book and maybe start a group where you are. If you want to start singles, grow singles ministry, please go to the singlesnetwork.org. And if you want to support what I do, you believe in what I'm doing, you want to help me keep doing what I'm doing, please uh, become a monthly partner. I would so appreciate it because more and more of what I'm doing is becoming less, less of income, is more of just stepping out in faith and speaking and teaching where God wants me to and becoming more of a missionary. And uh, I'll be going back to uh, Europe this September for a short tour in England, and I'm very blessed and thankful to get to go back. And so your donations help to not only get me to do what God's called me to do, but it also helps so many others who um, indirectly will be supported by your gifts as well. So thanks a lot. Another great week, and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Bye.